Hi, I'm Nancy Frischberg, and I want to just say welcome to Kate to Hair because this is your first appearance this year at the Linguistics Career Launch. But Kate and I have been acquainted for many, many, many years from our, uh, I think initially from our relationship to Bake High, where you were the dinner coordinator and I showed up at dinner a bunch. Mm -hmm. And so we got acquainted there and actually have even worked together sometimes uh, in the intervening years. And Kate's now been at Salesforce for Wow, more than five years, right? Nine years, yeah. Nine years, wow. All right, Kate, take it away. Tell us everything. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Welcome to Write Great Error Messages. This is an introduction for you, for linguists today. So, um, well, today we'll cover what error messages are and how they get to be where they are. Um, why they deserve your attention, your linguistic attention, um, and how to apply our expertise as linguists um, to error messages. We'll talk about standards and audience, interaction design and, and process, and then we'll split up into small groups and uh, look at uh, some examples and then uh, get back together and uh, report on what we've seen. My background, um, I, uh, as Nancy said, I've been working uh, uh, at Salesforce for nine years. I um, have written thousands of error messages of various kinds uh, and also written a lot of standards and, and guidelines for um, over that are in use by over 200 uh, technical writers at Salesforce. Um, I have a patent on a process for uh, organizing and managing user interface text. And um, uh, that's, that's me in a nutshell. So what are error messages and how do they get where they are? Um, in, in software, we talk about that, the happy path. So that's what happens in an ideal world. Um, and before I talk more about that, I'm, um, I'm gonna, I wanna show you a, a, a historical example of an error message from the 1970s. Yeah, so um, <laughs> um, it, it's arguable, um, and you could argue about whether Hal's end of that conversation was guided. I know some of you have been in the conversation design track over the last few weeks, but um, so an error is something that knocks a user off of that happy path, just the way the software is supposed to work. It's like any other user interface text, it's part of a like any other other user interface text, it's part of a conversation with someone who wants to get something done. But now the conversation runs off the rails, and and um, you have to get your conversation partner. You, as the error message writer, have to get your conversation partner back on track. So, how do error messages come to exist, and and where do they pop up? Well, first, there are a few kinds of error messages. Um, so one is, uh, for example, the validation. So for example, you've left a required field empty and the software checks to make sure that you can't continue without providing that information, or you've put the wrong sort of value in a field. Those are, those are validations. Um, other kinds of errors are exceptions. Um, so for example, the connection, that's the technical term. So for example, the connection between your device and the software server has been lost. Even, you know, maybe your Wi-Fi goes down or there's some problem with the server. Um, those are some of the ways that they, you know, error messages can 
errors can happen. So who identifies these scenarios so that you can write the messages? Well, engineers, designers, researchers, you, sometimes it's users, your customers uh, find problems and report them and uh, the engineers fix them. Um, and by the way, engineers is a synonym for programmers, which is a synonym for uh, developers. So you'll, you'll see all those um, terms used. Um, uh, but the, the a team of people working on software has to, they have to I somehow identify um, these messages. Uh, I've worked in places where that's kind of an ad hoc, a little bit random uh, process. Um, and in other places, the process can be really structured and it's um, paired with test planning for the software. Um, where do messages appear? Um, what do they look like? Well, they can appear on mobile devices, on desktop computers, they can appear in, in different OSs um, and uh, they can appear in dialogue boxes, which you've all seen a little window with a title and a body and a button, or they can appear in something called a toast, which is a banner that pops up. That's why it's, they call it a toast. Um, there also are um, API errors. Um, that's uh, errors that are just seen by uh, software developers making software. And I'll go into that a little bit uh, more later. So why do error, error messages messages deserve the attention of a linguist. Well, linguists understand how language generates meaning and prompts emotion. Um, you know, in a lot of companies, errors and other UI text is written by engineers and designers. And I think that goes a long way toward explaining why so much software is so hard to use. So um, good for companies um, that employ writers, um, linguists to, to do this work. I once worked with a developer, we were working on a project and I asked him, is there any UI text in this particular part of the project we were working on? He said, no, just some error messages. <laughs> so, um, that's not the right attitude. <laughs> so what, linguists know how to convey meaning. You know how to make sentences work, right? Um, an error message is an interruption and it can worsen the distraction. The, the message itself can worsen the distraction of the error or it, it can resolve it. Um, so how are word choice and syntax operating in, for example, this message that you can see on the screen, you know, something to, something to think about. How does your brain respond to an error? Well, your prefrontal cortex is involved in trying to resolve linguistic ambiguity. And those neurons are firing in there and they're engaging you. Like you wanna solve the problem. If the message is confusing, your brain's gonna be stuck there and those neurons are gonna be firing and, and keep you in that state of confusion. You as a linguist can resolve confusion. And sometimes, sometimes the, the difference between clarity and confusion is pretty subtle. And, and that's where, you know, really you can, we can all come in and, and save the day. Linguists also understand language's emotional impact um, at a, a crucial juncture in the user's experience. So um, timing is a, um, a part of how error message messages affect us. Um, it is, it, does an error message come up late in the process of something that you as a user are doing? Does it, you know, does the error result in extra work? These are things to be aware of and, and think about. You may not be able to, um, per, you as, as the writer probably can't prevent the error, but, uh, but you can mitigate its impact on users. Uh, think about the context. Is are you? Uh, is the user dealing with sensitive information like medical and health information, um, or or money, bank data? Um, another thing is what what is so then the content is the part that you have control over. Is is the look and the 
are the look and the feel and the tone sensitive and helpful? Or are they oblivious and inappropriate? Um, you know, no one likes to be interrupted. And when errors appear, they tend to, to um, make users annoyed or even upset. So your, your message has a, a, an important role in mitigating that and helping a user get back on track. All right, let's talk about some do's and don'ts. Um, what should you put in an error message? Um, well, the main thing is to say what went wrong and how to fix it. An error message is sort of a, you know, starts, it's a sort of you are here. It's a map back to where you want to be in the software. So it's sort of you are here at plus directions for, for getting back on the, on the trail. So in this message, we've got, um, a title, we say what's wrong, you can't, you can't run your report. And then there's a body that uh, talks about why. Um, and, uh, and then there's a button that where the user can acknowledge that they've seen this thing. In some cases, the button can uh, go to, you know, say, say, say what you need to do to fix the problem is to change a setting. So the button could go and open up your settings page. In this case, um, you, user clicks got it, the dialog goes away and there's the report again with its filter adjustments and, and the user uses those and, and tries again. So that's how this area is resolved. Um, more about what to put in there um, to help users recover and get back on, on track, focus on the solution more than on what the problem is. So on the left, uh, there's a zip code field and uh, the message says the zip code you entered is invalid. So like I say, what, say what users can do rather than what they can't. So on the right, it says enter a valid zip code and that's nice and clear. Um, this idea of saying what, what's wrong and then how to fix it, often you end up with two sentences and two short sentences are always better than one long one. Um, but sometimes you can easily imply the problem in the solution rather than first stating the problem and then the solution. And that, that's what's happening in this message here. Let's look at some don'ts. Um, be really concise. Just, uh, it's amazing how you can cut back and cut back and, and um, it's a, a sort of a, it's important to be really concise, make every word count. And you're a linguist, so you've got this. Leave out irrelevant details. Just tell users what they need to know. Um, you may get lots of details, information from, from a, an engineer uh, when you get specs for writing an error message. And it's your job to figure out just what users need to know and, and know more. Um, they're trying to figure out how to get unstuck and extra information is, is just confusing. So think of it as a kind of um, budget with, Everything, an error message has to compete with everything that's on the screen, in the room, inside a user's head. All of that is swirling around in, in a user's brain. So th think of this as a kind of budget process. So with each message scenario, uh, you have limited space and time to get the user back to the happy path. So, you know, use it well. Um, so examples of irrelevant information are, uh, Technical information for programmers, if you're writing for, you know, like a consumer interface, then just uh, developers will tend to give you technical information. It doesn't belong there um, for users if it's something they don't, you know, unless it's something they don't need and then you need to express it in a way that is going to make sense to them. Uh, another thing is a business process. So raise your hand if you've been in a conversation with a customer service representative who's responded to your problem by explaining how the company's system works. Do you care? No. <laughs> um, so 
yeah, stay away from business process and stuff like that that really doesn't matter to users. That's one of the things that can um, confuse and annoy them. Um, an overall thing, and this doesn't only apply to error messages, but to user interface text in general, um, there are English words that have, that, uh, have developed engineering meanings, in other words, jargon. Um, and, and they show up in these kind of stilted sounding constructions because they, the, they come from engineering concepts. Um, so for example, submit, we've all seen a button that says, buttons that say submit, um, that comes from engineering jargon. Use the English, verb that describes what the user is actually doing. So it's save or send, what it, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, uh, failed is another um, uh, term that's used in engineering and it has really bad connotations <laughs> in English. So, you know, just talk about what actually is going on from the user's point of view, like you couldn't save the task. Um, insufficient privileges uh, is a term that comes up uh, in uh, applications that involve permission to do something or another thing. Um, you know, again, just speak English there and talk about permission to access or something like that. Um, okay, so here's one successfully, uh, and this is not again, not only related to error messages, but uh, I'm gonna talk about it because it's really pervasive. So programmers, the way software development works is programmers send uh, what's called an API, API, they send a call out and then a response comes back and um, it's, it's deemed completed, whether the call succeeds or fails in what it, whatever it was trying to do. Um, so you see, you really see th this task failed successfully example here is really comes from real life because that's kind of, that's how, um, that's how programming works. Um, but of course in English, the phrase successfully completed makes no sense because what's, what's the opposite of successfully completed. Um, but, but this notion of successfully has really propagated all over all kinds of user interfaces. I've seen it at gas pumps and all over the place. So uh, when you see that word successfully, take it out. All right, so let's talk about some st about standards, um, mechanics of, of writing. The, Probably the most important thing is to keep sentences short. And that's, again, an overall rule in technical writing. Um, it's one of the most important ways that you can uh, keep content uh, usable, easy to read. Um, they help everyone. They help non-native speakers of English looking at your app. Um, they help translators uh, translating your material into other, other languages and locales and, and everyone really, it's just easier for everyone to read shorter, simpler sentences. And, and in general, two short sentences are better than one long one. And that took me a little while to get used to as a writer, um, uh, but that giving people information in shorter chunks really helps usability. Use the imperative or the first person. So talk to users, talk to users with them. Don't talk at them. So in the first example, uh, the user should contact their IT person for help. This message is being displayed to the person who should be, con you know, whose job it is, who needs to contact the IT person. So don't, um, this is a typical, so, typical sort of construction that you might see when engineers or in, you know, people who aren't experienced in writing, uh, write messages like this. So just, just use the imperative. Imagine that you're, again, you're in a conversation with someone, you're talking with them. Couldn't save the document for help, contact your IT person. Take your cues 
from the UI. Just uh, do what you can to um, understand how the soft, you know, how the software works. Um, walk through each task that you're you're uh, writing error messages for in in a user's shoes. Um, so one point there is to give information in the order users need it. Um, so it, in the second part of this example, where it's of this bullet, where it says select customize on the layout page in your settings. Well, what do you need to do first? First, you need to go to the settings and then the layout page, and then you select customize. So if you have a, a sentence like select customize on the layout page in your settings, then users have to read the sentence twice, once forward, and then they need to read it backward again. So um, don't do that to users uh, in error messages or anything else. Um, in general, use the order if this, then that, uh, rather than you know, the other the other way around, you know, for, for similar reasons. So every now and then there's something that, um, there's an exception like uh, for that robot, uh, I'm not a robot checkbox that we all have to check sometimes to identify ourselves. Um, check the box if you're not a robot, it works better than if you're not a robot, check the box. Uh, there is a, um, for detecting these kinds of things, if, if your company has a program like Acrolinks or something similar that's a sort of uh, souped up, those are sort of souped up spelling and grammar checkers, and they um, can, uh, they flag sentences with if in the middle, so they'll, they'll catch your if then, uh, your flipped if then constructions, um, and oh, and they also will count words. In a, in a sentence, which is a super handy feature. So if your sentence is 32 words long, um, at, you know, if you run one of these checkers on it, it can catch that sort of stuff for you. Um, you wanna echo the wording and capitalization in the UI, and especially in an error message, uh, because it helps the user stay on track. Um, it helps them user map what the error says to says to do back into the UI. A um, couple notes about internationalization um, and optimizing content for that. So localization um, is includes translation into various languages and dialect, but also local dialects, uh, local dates and times. So it's not only about the translation per se, but but also about everything. So for, if you think of, you know, Montreal versus Paris, there's different versions of French, different time zones um, and like that. So that's what internet, in, internationalization refers to optimizing whatever you're doing for that process. Um, again, a, a plugin like Acrolinks flags modal verbs, um, which, uh, some modal verbs have more than one meaning, for example, may and might, so uh, it's best to avoid those because uh, again, they can cause problems in you know, mistranslation or uh, even for uh, English as a second language speakers. Um, you can replace words like may with can and so on. That's probably a whole other workshop <laughs> maybe next year. Um, the word should can have a whole range of meanings from it's generally best to you absolutely must to this is what happens if everything is working right. So um, avoid the word should and just cut to the real verb. Uh, one more note about uh, internationalization, don't concatenate. and. So I'll explain what that means. Error messages and other user interface text in computer code are called strings. Um, and if a programmer puts two or more strings together to form one sentence, that's called concatenation. Remember that each string is delivered to translators separately. All they get is one string at a time. So if you divide a sentence in two and one string includes the subject and the other includes the verb, Translator can't do their job. So don't uh, let a programmer uh, split things up, uh, split sentences up into separate 
strings. And that should be nothing smaller than a sentence. Uh, oh, and a few other tips about internationalization. Translated strings can be up to 30% longer. So keep that in mind um, when you're writing and, and work with your programmer and designer to make sure messages fit into this space that you have. Um, you, you're, you're, you can put, your, your developer can put comments in the code to clarify ambiguity for, for translators. Uh, and then the translators will see the comments, but the but end users won't. So um, some words can be ambiguous out of context, like the word state. Are you referring to Alaska or to the status of something? Um, some words can be a noun or a verb, order, access. Um, they, they may be identical in English, but not in other languages. They would be different words. Um, so, um, some grammar tips. Well, be precise. Um, you know, watch for dangling and misplaced modifiers. Um, you know, again, if you're, if you're, it, it's really important in error messages to be precise and concise. Um, so dangling and misplaced modifiers need, need to go. Um, one thing, uh, one sort of wording construction that I see a lot is uh, acting as if processes were people, but they, a process can't act on itself. So don't say that a setup process didn't complete, say that it isn't finished. Um, the passive voice, which we, we are told so often to stay away from, it can be the right choice there are cases where specifying a, a subject can just be distracting. Um, so in this sentence, email was sent to Sarah Johnson and three others. Well, where would you, you know, if you put in a subject, you know, uh, the software sent email to Sarah Johnson and three others, you don't really know, I need to know, you know, what the subject is. Um, it's, it's enough to put this in the passive voice. Develop standard phrasing and usage uh, for your app that you're working on because consistency helps minimize uncertainty and it also reduces your workload once you get the standard phrasing um, down. Um, so, you know, standard messages for common situations like, um, uh, you know, the server went down or something. Here are some examples um, of some standard messaging. Um, and then document your standards, um, you know, whatever you decide on and, and follow your company's style guide. Um, consider your company's voice and tone guidelines because your because error messages should be, you know, consistent with um, all the other uh, com company, all the other the company's other materials in voice and tone. And, and I recommend um, if you're a UX writer taking a copy editing course because um, there's a lot that uh, kind of uh, basic publishing standards and techniques, um, you know, can contribute to the whole process of, to any process of writing. Uh, and let's see, one more thing about standards, please and sorry. Um, brought this up, we have, we have standards for these at Salesforce. And uh, so please, we only use when the problem is the software's fault. And sorry, we use only when the user can't continue without help. And this seems kind of like a subtle distinction, but these are the kinds of subtle signals that help users understand what's going on. Okay, audience, um, we talk about tone and word choice. So who's using what you're making? You know, really understand this, like I was saying before, you know, under, understand how the, your, the software is used and, and who's using it. Imagine walking in their shoes. Are, are you making software for business people? for bird watchers, for kids? Are, are you making something that software developers themselves will use? Or just really 
know know your users as you know get to know your users as well as you can um, and find out you can find out about them from a product manager you're working with product managers are listening to customers all the time and um, a lot of companies have user experience researchers um, who do studies and uh, write reports about how users have reacted to say prototypes or you know existing software and um, they create representative, they can create representative personas, different kinds of people and um, how many of the software in their, you know, daily activities. Um, and, um, and just a note about um, API, I mentioned APIs before. So if you're, and I'll explain what that means. If you're writing for software programmers, developer, um, if you're writing API error messages, uh, API stands for application programming interface. And this is and not for end users, this is for programmers who are building software. Um, the, the difference in those messages is that AP, APIs, programmers are just working on in code line, just one line at a time. So the error messages need more information incorporated in them because when, when they appear, developers don't have the kind of context that end users have. Like if you're, if you're uh, using, if you're using Salesforce, which is business software, you say you're a salesperson and you're using the software and you're working on a, uh, an account record and an error comes up, you're still seeing the account record there. There's a lot of context around the, around the message. A programmer doesn't have it can't see, the programmer can't see what field we're talking about or what value they might be missing. So you have to specify all of that in the message and that makes the messages more detailed um, and, and longer. Um, but just remember, so I, I don't have a, particularly a technical background, but I have written a lot of um, error messages for developers in Salesforce. And it, it's just a matter of, you know, asking questions and taking time to become familiar with what the software does as a whole and, and figuring out, figuring stuff out. That's um, a, an important skill of a technical writer is just asking questions, keep asking, you know, figuring out how to get the information that you need. And, and also just remember that developers are people too, you know, they want clear, useful directions, just like other users and um, you know you as a linguist um, can provide that. Should you be funny? Well, it depends. Consider the content and the context because humor can work well in error messages, but be aware of a couple of things. So humor can interfere with clarity because it requires a layer of interpretation uh, and it can, in that way, can interrupt a user's thought process. Um, and, you know, just as in real life, humor can strike the wrong tone. It can make users feel that um, the company isn't handling their data securely. Again, think of money or health data. Um, and, and humor is, is more often than not culture specific and tends not to translate well. Um, so if your software is localized, just be very careful about that. And again, remember that errors appear at a crucial juncture and tend to make users feel annoyed or even upset. So um, just be careful with humor. A little bit on interaction design. How do people interact, interact with your messages to get back on track. Sometimes a developer will ask you to write a message that covers lots of things. And at some point you recognize you, you, this is too complicated. You can't write a clear error message. There are too many possibilities to explain. So on the left here, um, Basically, the user can't renew the subscription, but for a couple of different reasons. And uh, in this case, I and and each 
each reason has a separate resolution. So I asked the developer to split um, the code into so that two separate messages could be displayed. Um, and then each one has a separate resolution. In one case, the user can open the settings and change the settings. In the other case, um, user can't, has to click OK and then go and do something else. But, it, but at least each message has a specific one single action uh, associated with it as the solution. So work, you work with your developer to figure that out. Another way to work with developers is to prevent an error from happening in the first place. Um, so you work with a developer and sometimes a designer to do this. So on the left here, we have um, you're on a you're buying shoes and um, there's a field where you select a color. But right now the only option is black. So, uh, but you you neglected to make a make the selection for that field, so you got an error. It says and the, the field is required. So you have to select a color before you can go on. But this is kind of dumb and annoying because there's only one selection. So why didn't it just you know decide for you? So on the right, uh, I got the developer to supposing I was the writer here, the, the, the writer has gotten a developer to uh, make black the default selection. So it's already pre-selected and the user, there's, there's no opportunity for an error to happen. You might not want black shoes, but that's a different problem. Different error formats have different writing requirements. So here in, on the left and right, we have the same message, but it's written differently because in one case it's displayed in a dialog box, which has a title and a body and a button in this case. And um, on the right, it's really it's the same message, but it's written uh, for display in a, a toast, which was that uh, banner that I mentioned that is called a toast because it pops up. Um, so I'm not addressing visual design here, but be familiar with your company's design standards and work with your developer to make sure that messages are displayed in a way that makes sense. Um, okay, so sometimes, um, unfortunately, there are error scenarios where users can't solve the problem themselves and they need to pass information along to someone else. Um, these scenarios are harder to handle gracefully. Um, so here's an example of one of those where a user has to ask their IT person to, to do something. Um, and there's, there's really no good way uh, currently of handling this. Maybe in the, in the future, uh, AI will help situations like this. Um, these, these kinds of scenarios are usually the result of some edge case, something obscure that happens. So just do what you can to make the information transfer from the user to the other party, you know, as painless as possible. All right, a little bit about process, um, collaborating with engineers, researchers, designers, product managers. How do, you, how do you get started writing, working, working with all these people? Well, you gather information about each error um, and you, you set up a document or spreadsheet with a template or columns and I'll, I'll have a, some, uh, a template that you can copy and, and take away um, at the end of the class. Um, so give it, these columns, a summary of what the error scenario is, what, what triggers the error and how the user can fix it. Um, another column to indicate how the error is displayed. Is it a dialog box or a toast or is it an API error message? Uh, it's useful to have a place to put any existing text or draft that the developer can provide um, because even if these um, 
even if that stuff isn't written well, it, contained help, it can contain helpful clues for you um, on communicating uh, exactly what the problem is and how to fix it. Um, and have a space for drafting and finalizing your messages. Um, I suggest color coding it to indicate whether it's uh, in draft or final. Um, and then any other columns that you might want for tracking the, the work item and so on. Uh, so you, um, you want to QA, do your own QA of error messages. Um, when it gets checked into the, in most cases, writers can't check in uh, error strings themselves. They need developers to do that for them. Um, so companies handle this in, in various ways and it can be a manual process where the programmer copies your text into a, an XML file. These are called label files in programmer speak. Um, your company may have some kind of content management system for user interface text uh, or there may be a, a plug to an app that UX designers use. There are different ways. I think the industry needs better solutions for user interface text. Uh, some best practices, um, as I say, you should QA what programmers check in because they can misinterpret your specs. You can't just count on them automatically um, to get everything right. Everybody makes um, oversights sometimes, even people who are very good and detail oriented. And just remember that correction, if you correct something now, right up front, as soon as the error is introduced, it's much less costly than trying to fix it later on, especially like if a customer finds it and complains. And then document your process and, um, and use communication channels in your company to reinforce the process uh, so that developers don't just make up their own text and check it in without your knowing. Um, so just a uh, Last word. So, what about the future of error messages? You know, will AI be involved in error messages? Voice technology. Some of you probably know more about this than I do. Voice technology already can detect a caller's mood, and change the voice menu accordingly. Um, I I did once yell into the phone, <laughs> and then get a different response back from the bot. That was an interesting experience. Um, so will, in the future, is AI, artificial intelligence, is it going to be used to detect problems and respond to users? Could it walk you through a solution? I just think there's a, a great future for linguists um, in UX writing. So you're in, you're in the right place. Okay, um, Rachel is going to um, split you into small groups and Let's see. Um, she's going to share a doc with you um, with a couple of sections. There are some, some errors, some sample error messages, uh, nine of those, and some sample um, scenarios plus draft messages. And there's no, um, so what I'd like you to do is, is just um, just uh, in your groups, pick a few, one or two, or use the examples that you brought, if you brought them, you know, what, whatever interests you, it doesn't matter. And, and talk in your group about what works and what you might change. Um, and then we'll regather in, what time is it? Let's, um, let's try to regroup at 1.35 to give, Give everybody time to just sort of peruse the messages and and discuss things. Um, right, it's not one thirty-five everywhere, but thirty-five minutes after the hour. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Speaking of localization, local <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't talked about it yet. It's coming up tomorrow morning. So. <laughs> um, and then uh, Rachel will also um, share with you an, another file, which is a, a template that you can copy for gathering information if you go out and get a job as a um, user experience writer. So that's what this that's what this looks like here. So um, Rachel, take it away.
One of the questions that you didn't get a chance to answer earlier from Caroline, do you want to say it, Caroline? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so, well, one thing we actually spoke about in the breakout rooms was, I guess, how common confusing or ambiguous error messages are in very mainstream um, programs such as Tableau, R, um, Latex. And so one thing I was wondering was uh, what types of resistance you've encountered from different stakeholders and um, in, you know, wanting to dedicate time and resources to writing good error messages? And do you have any advice for how to convince particularly non-linguist or non-linguistically minded stakeholders of the value of evaluating uh, error messages in detail and writing good error messages? That's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there is research showing that um, error messages are really important to developers working on some good error messages are really important to them. Um, I don't, I don't have it handy. Uh, if there's a place, uh, Nancy, maybe where I can follow up with information that I can find. Um, um, if you pass it to uh, us, we can uh, put it in the Slack and we can send it out in the daily email, whichever you like. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend that we not uh, take up Kelly and Trisha's second to that question because the next session will focus on that as well. Right, Sue? So Sue, just make a note of those questions. Okay. Sorry, Kate, back to you. Um, uh, yeah. So for, um, for developer documentation, for uh, not documentation, for, for APIs, error messages are really a, a very important part of a developer's workflow and they, they need to be clear and actionable. Um, and this same for end users. I mean, if you have, if you have um, I mentioned user researchers, um, you know, see if you talk with your researchers and try to get them to do a study on error messages in your, pro your company's product so that you can then, you know, and, and, record it, <laughs> record people struggling or commenting, you know, making negative comments um, and bring that back to stakeholders. Uh, those would be a couple of suggestions. Thank you. Or we can have a first version of that answer and then go on and do more answers when we have more people. Or Nancy said, or have UX researchers coach you on how you can test your own error messages. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? So uh, talk a little bit about what your group process was like and how you helped each other write error messages because I wasn't in a group. Um, we um, talked about good messages and bad messages rather than writing any messages per mm. se. Mm. And I commented that uh, oftentimes no message where one is needed is very problematic. Sure. Right? So sure. Uh, I was trying to make a reservation, an airline reservation and uh, put the reservation on hold fair. Um, unbeknownst to me, because there was no information about it on the website, that route did not let you put hold fair on it. But had there been an error message, I would have saved a lot of time and frustration. Mm -hmm. So I guess the company didn't have very good uh, UX people involved. Right, they didn't, they didn't investigate, they didn't lay out right. use cases, yeah. Um, Chuck had a question, will, will I share the answers for the exercise? <laughs> well, because there aren't any answers. <laughs> this is all just about, about exploring, um, you know, based on what you've, uh, learn so that there's no answer key, sorry. But I thought you guys were doing a great job in your, um, in your breakout room. So you're on the right track. And Alfonso has, Alfonso's raising his hand. How nice. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, so basically, I just wanted to comment on the role of culture when it comes to um, error messages. For example, in our group, um, I find it very interesting that we mentioned humor as a something that, for me, that's something that works out well, you know, like when you're just trying to deal with all this frustration, like, oh, technically this is not working. And uh, for Sue and Miriam, humor perhaps is not the best approach to it, but um, to me, it's always kind of, you know, um, when I just get a bit of a wink from the computer, it's something that I find very interesting and I just find it catchy, it just kind of helps me relax the entire process. So I suppose that culture might be something to take into account there. And again, US uh, research might be useful in that regard too. And I think they've both been working on uh, business facing, business users software rather than consumer facing software. So that may be another reason that we hold back on the humor in the business context. Mm -hmm. But yes, a little a little snark can be very nice on a 404 page, you know? Oh my goodness, how did you get here? I'm so sorry, let's move you on. Nothing to see here, you know, one of those things. Or, or a little self-deprecating humor like, oops, we're so embarrassed, um, please uh, forgive us and, you know, try this. You know, it just, the, the humor has to be handled carefully so that the reader does, the user doesn't think we're poking fun at the reader, or, you know, the user, but poking fun at ourselves as the developer maybe. I think that can kind of defuse some of the anger <laughs> that people feel. <laughs> yeah, again, keeping in mind, be careful of the context because you can uh, make it look as if the, you just have to be careful. You can make it right. seem that the company isn't taking your, your data. Right. Seriously. You, you don't want to convey something like, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, the, um, yeah. because the, 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 the user is already fairly sensitive right now. <laughs> Things have gone badly. <laughs> But I think, Alfonso, you had a nice example of one in Spanish that um, seemed very kind of relaxed and um, not overly wordy, but, you know, still fairly direct, but it was uh, in plain language and, um, yeah, and you found it comforting. I think comforting is a good feeling to come away from. Uh, True, and as you mentioned, it, it was worded in a very uh, nice way so that it actually blamed the developer, the software, or the, in this case, the uh, Mozilla. Um, I was like, oops, or oof, we cannot reach that place. You know, so it's, it's as you mentioned, it's humor, but very nicely touched. So um, I, I, I totally like that remark. So yeah. Well, in order to give uh, Sue and Kate a chance to splash water on their face or whatever they need to do in the next 10 minutes. I think we're gonna to have to close out this session.